people in the past so long. I know many of you have been praying uh, for Brother Nick LaRosa uh, and for his dad. And about an hour ago uh, this morning, he, uh, he didn't pass away. And so we would be able to remember him today and uh, obviously his family and lift them up to the Lord this time. Brother Blake? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come here today and worship you and who you are and what you do. Lord, you are so worthy. Lord, we thank you for your grace, Father. Just thank you for all the many blessings that you give us in our lives. And just help us to remember how faithful you are in every aspect of our lives. Lord, we just pray that as we open your word today, that you open our hearts, open our minds. Lord, fill us, work in us, fill us with your Holy Spirit. And just give us a great day here. Lord, we thank you for giving us our pastor. We ask you just to work through him and bless the worship, bless our choir, and give us a great day here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
know Pastor Ben welcomed you earlier, mentioned about our, our Sunday school hour that we have before our worship service, and we do hope you come back next week for that. I do want to remind you, when you came in, hopefully you got a bulletin, and in that bulletin there's a lot of announcements. We'll update you on those at the close of the service. But there is also a connecting card, and we ask all our members, our guests, uh, if this is your first time with us, take some time, fill out that connecting card, and at the close of the service, when we pass the offering plates, you can just slip that in there. There's also a place there if you have a prayer request or a need in your life. We want to know about it. We want to help you. We want to pray with you about that. So if you want to mark that down there or, or submit that, you can do that, and we'll look over that this week and pray with you about the needs uh, that you might have. So if you can't take that, fill that out at some point in the service. And like I said, the closed service, uh, put that in the offer plate. Well, we have a great kids program, first through sixth grade. This is your chance. If you're heading back to Kids Church, King's Kids as we call it, you can go ahead and make your way back there. Um, and if this is your first time, and maybe they're a little bit nervous about parents, you're welcome to head back there with them until they get comfortable and see what it's all about. We welcome you to go, to go see that. Um, and everyone else, would you do this? Would you stand up, turn around, greet one another? We'll come back and sing in just a moment.
um, declaration that's made. And so I hope that you'll do this with me this morning. Matthew 16, if you would stand as we read together. Matthew 16, beginning in verse number 13. And looking at this today, a vision of Christ's supremacy. A vision of Christ's supremacy. Matthew 16, follow along as I read verse number 13, by the way. If you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you. There should be a Bible around you somewhere. Pick it up. Uh, open it up to Matthew's Gospel, which is the very first book of the New Testament. And that Bible that you're holding on to, if you don't have one, you can take it home with you. And let's try to get to you today. Matthew 16, beginning in verse number 13, says this. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, Study there. He asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. You can see the declaration that Peter made right there, so powerfully and so adequately, when he says in verse number 16, he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This morning, let's be a people who can make and will make this declaration each and every day of our lives that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives, and we need to search him, and we need to make that we work for him, and we serve him as the supreme God today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time that we have in your word. I ask that you would speak to us now as we look at this grand subject, which is you. Lord, help us to remind ourselves of your supremacy over every area of our lives. Lord, help us to claim you as our king. Lord, help us to know you as our Christ. Lord, help us to walk with you and to serve you in such a great way because we know that you are supreme. Lord, for those areas that we do not have surrendered to you at this moment in time, we ask that you would reveal those to us, that you might help us to surrender them to you. Lord, for those who are here this morning, they do not yet know Jesus as Savior. I ask that you would speak to them. Encourage them through the power of your word and your Holy Spirit to draw them to Jesus Christ so that they would be saved by your great grace. We thank you that once we were lost and now we're found. We thank you that once we were blind and now we can see because of the great grace of Jesus. And we thank you that as the supreme Lord that you humbled yourself and you came to this earth and you became a man so that you might be able to die for us. What a wonderful exhibit of love and humility. Lord, help us to serve you like that. Lord, we love you. We ask that you would help our church. Lord, help us now to get a great vision of who you are. And may it change our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we look at the word of God today, I want to encourage you as we think about having a vision of Christ's supremacy. Peter was a Jew by birth and by heritage, and he declares that Jesus Christ is God. Himself. Now that's a very strong and a very stark statement for many people. And in this dynamic sermon on the in his dynamic sermon on even on the day of Pentecost, Peter once again declared that truth. In Acts 236, he said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God ha that hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the question Jesus posed in our text today, in Matthew 16, 15, is just as relevant and just as provocative as the moment that it was very first asked 2,000 years ago. Jesus asked that question, he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And I hope that today you will answer that question, because that question is important for your life. That question is important to my life. That question is important to the future of our church and the future of our community as we seek to glorify God and to reach our generation. But what about our generation? When we think about our community, how do people today answer this question about who Jesus Christ is? Much like in the word of God, when Jesus asked the question of his disciples, there are people today who will say this, well, Jesus, uh, he, was a, he was a good prophet. And by the way, Jesus was a good prophet. But remember this, that Jesus was much more than just a good prophet. 
Some people say that he was a great teacher. And honestly, there are so many examples in the Word of God that those of you who are teachers, Sunday school teachers, you work in a school, or you teach other people in your professional uh, career, let me remind you there are great things that we can learn about Jesus and from Jesus about being a good teacher. But Jesus is much more than just a good teacher. Some may say that he was a wonderful moral example. They put him on the par of uh, like Gandhi or something like that. And, and by the way, Jesus lived a perfect and a sinless life. What better example could you find to follow in your life of somebody who was a great moral example? Jesus was perfect. But some say that he was an outstanding philosopher. They put him along with Plato and Aristotle and others there. And when it comes to thinking about Jesus, he was a great philosopher, yes. But let's remember this, that Jesus was so much more than just a great philosopher. C.S. Lewis, the eminent British scholar and author, who prior to his conversion, he was an agnostic. He wrote these words about Jesus. As he wrote, he says, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. What do they say? They say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says that he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something else. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about being his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. In fact, C.S. Lewis says, he did not intend to be. So it comes down to only three viable possibilities, as C.S. Lewis alludes to. Either Jesus Christ was a liar, he was a lunatic, or he was exactly who he claimed to be. And that is the Lord God Almighty. All of this evidence, if carefully and honestly judged, will lead to the conclusion that Jesus Christ, in fact, is exactly who he says that he was. And when we get a clear vision of his supremacy, let me remind you that his image makes an impact that is transformational on your life and my life. So, this morning, I bid you to recognize Christ as the Supreme Lord. Recognize Jesus Christ as the Supreme Lord of every area of your life. There are many, many things that we deal with as we go from day to day. We have fears. We have some things that are exciting. We have plans. We have goals. Uh, we have decisions to make each and every moment. When it comes to what we are doing in life, we must recognize Jesus Christ as the supreme Lord of our lives and everything. Growing up in Pennsylvania, I was reminded as we went tool back into Pennsylvania for Christmas uh, just a few weeks ago. and There was a convenience store. And uh, when I was a kid, it's not made this anymore, but change and progress has changed things along the way, but uh, it used to be called Penn Supreme, a mixture of the word Pennsylvania and Supreme. It was a convenience store. Uh, this idea, carrying this, that it was the Supreme. It was the greatest convenience store in the entire state. We started to think about this t uh, term, uh, Supreme. In fact, there was a music group called the Supremes, correct? Uh, they must have thought a lot about their music, right? To think that they were the Supreme music group uh, in the entire world. In Star Wars, the Supreme leader, supposedly a guy named Snoke, what a name, uh, but he wasn't so Supreme if he could be dethroned. Caesars, kings, queens. Dictators and chancellors and peers and prime ministers and pre uh, presidents and emperors have all claimed to be supreme. And by the way, let me remind you that they aren't the only ones who claim to be supreme. There are many times that you and I have also claimed to be supreme. There are things that we want. There are goals that we have. 
There are things that we desire. There are things that we complain about. There are things that we ridicule. But let me remind you and I that we have laid claim to this title that we are supreme. But let's look at the scripture today and remind ourselves as we recognize Christ is the supreme Lord. Number one, we see in our text and surrounding passages, and we'll note a few different things, and I hope that you'll jot down a few notes um, this morning as we think about Jesus Christ being the supreme Lord. Number one, the importance of recognizing Christ as supreme Lord. Let me remind you in the first place, it's an important thing to recognize Christ as the supreme Lord because he is the only way into fellowship with God. The only way. Now, if you go into this world, the world's going to try to tell you that you can know God all kinds of different ways. Uh, in fact, some people say all roads lead to heaven. That's not true. And we understand the word of God tells us in John 14, 6. You know the passage. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the only way. Jesus Christ is the only truth. Jesus Christ is the only life that can give you a relationship with God. You cannot earn it. Let me remind you that Jesus Christ is the only one who can save. So we think about Jesus Christ being the supreme Lord as he declares that he is the way of salvation. You cannot get to heaven. You cannot have a relationship with God other than through Jesus Christ who is the supreme Lord. There's another truth when it comes to recognizing the importance of Jesus Christ as being supreme Lord. We also recognize this that it's important because he is the only way of freedom. I uh, say, well, I thought that being an American gives me freedom. Praise the Lord for the freedoms that we have in America. But let me remind you, one of the reasons why America has freedoms is because America was built upon the word of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Knowing this truth that the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God give you and me freedom from sin. So many people say, well, freedom, that gives me the, the liberty to do whatever I want to. There's a lot of things that we have freedoms to be able to do as Americans. And by the way, just because something is legal does not mean that it is right. But let me remind you, the Word of God shows us how we can find freedom, and it is found in Jesus Christ himself. John 8, 36, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be what? Free indeed. And if you want to be free indeed, you must come to Jesus Christ. Galatians 5, 1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Then he says this, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What he's saying there is when you get away from Jesus Christ, you start making all kinds of rules for yourself that are apart from Scripture. Then you start to get entangled. You start to lose your freedoms. True freedom is found in Jesus Christ. And he gives us the spiritual freedom, and Jesus liberates us from the bondage of sin. You say, Pastor, we're talking about revival. Yes, let me remind you, as we think about revival in your life and in my life, we can be set free from the bondage of sin. How many times is it that we have an invitation and it seems like your heart wants to go forward at the invitation time? And maybe you bow here in the front of the altar or you, uh, in the place where you're at and you say, God, please forgive me of this sin just one more time. And it seems like every time that we have an invitation, you're confessing the same sin or, or the same thing that you're trying to work out in life. Let me remind you that the Holy Spirit in the Supreme Lord, He can give you freedom from your sin. Let me remind you today that we find that freedom in Him. Thirdly, let me remind you, it's an important thing to make sure to lift up Jesus as the supreme Lord of our lives because He is the only way of forgiveness. How many of you like to be forgiven? We just do, right? Uh, all of us have done something wrong. When it comes to asking God for forgiveness, let's remind ourselves that ultimate forgiveness is found in Him. Acts 5.31 him have God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Acts 13, 38, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 7, 
in him we have redemption through his blood. Then he says this, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. I understand. Sometimes we like to hold grudges. By the way, it's not a good thing to do. But when it comes to our lives, when it comes to walking with Jesus, praise the Lord for this. How many of you can say it doesn't matter what happens in the world? People can help hold things up against you all the time, right? They can say that, hey, you were bad or you made a bad decision. Or, praise the Lord for this. How many of you know that there's forgiveness in Jesus Christ? Amen? So let's remind you. And the devil comes along. And he reminds you about your past. Remind him about his future. Amen? When it comes to finding freedom in Jesus, let's remind ourselves that these three ways, it's so important to remember that we must lift up Jesus Christ. Now, number two today, remember that there are some implications. If we know that Jesus Christ is the supreme Lord of our lives, then there are some implications, some things that really need to play out. Some things that need to change. Some things that need to work out. Some things that we need to seek to accomplish in the great grace of Jesus Christ. We remember when it comes to these implications, the lordship of Jesus Christ is recognized only through spiritual vision. And uh, we notice here in Matthew 16 of our text, it reminds us in verse number 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. This is a spiritual truth. Sometimes we wonder, why is it that the world does not accept Jesus as being the king and the ruler of their lives? Well, the reason is very, very basic. It's very, very simple. They don't have God in their lives. We cannot expect the world to recognize Christ as being supreme because Jesus is not the Lord of their lives. Pretty simple. But for those of you who do know Jesus as Savior, let me remind you that, yes, Jesus Christ needs to be not just your Messiah, not just your Christ, in the sense that he is your Savior, but he also needs to be the Lord, Lord, Lord of your life. He needs to be the one who is in charge, the one who is in control. Now, let's just put it down where the rubber meets the road. All of us, to one extent or another, no matter which way you like to slice it, all of us like to be control freaks somewhere. Some of you right now are thinking, man, I wish somebody would adjust the temperature. I don't like the lighting. I wish they played my favorite song today. I wish the preacher was preaching a different sermon. What time is he going to get out of there? And by the way, where are we going to lunch? I want to go to Burger King so I can have it made my way, right? There's all kinds of things that we want to do. When it comes to being American, we like to be in charge because we have the freedom to make our own decisions and choices, right? Well, praise the Lord for the freedoms that we have, but that freedom and liberty is found where? It's found in our Lord. As we follow him, you understand that following him gives us great liberty. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, it says, Wherefore, I, I give you to understand that no man, speaking by the Spirit of God, calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. This is a spiritual thing that works inside of you. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me remind you that the Holy Spirit is continually pressing upon you to say this. I, speaking about you and me, we need to be surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. We need to follow Him. Now, we know this is a wrestling match every day, is it not? How many of you would freely admit this, that there are some times in life where you are uppity up and you are just following Jesus? And there are other days where you are down and you down. But you're just kind of like down in the doldrums And you're like, the day's not going so good You flubbed, you, you sinned you, you made some mistakes along the way And it's just not a good day We all have those times But we must always recognize That Jesus Christ is the Supreme Lord We think about it because the Lordship of Jesus Christ Is more than an easy phrase to say You know how I know that? Because we can come to church And you can sing some songs And you can say, Jesus is the Lord Everybody's got, in fact, let's just say that together. Ready? Jesus the Lord. Let's say it together right now. Jesus is the Lord. That's pretty easy to say, is it not? We can sing lots of songs. In fact, probably some of you were listening to some songs on the way here. Uh, you'll go throughout this week and you'll try to sing some other songs along the way. They'll say that Jesus is the Lord. But how many of you know that even though you may say that, you may sing it, it may not always resonate right here. 
In fact, sometimes when it comes to singing those songs, how many of you know that after you know them for a while, uh, you can kind of tune out exactly what you're singing. You're not even paying attention to it anymore. You start to look around and say, hey, who's here today? What's going on? And rather than thinking and worshiping God, we focus on everything and everybody else. We can make sure that our attention is on our Supreme Lord. In much of Christendom, and I use that loosely, the Lordship of Jesus Christ is too much like the role of England's monarch. We think of how is that? It's lots of symbolism, but very little power. We think of Queen Elizabeth, for example. She is a national symbol, but she doesn't actually rule the nation. The Lordship of Jesus Christ implies that he is not just a symbol, but he is the power. He is the ultimate power with the ultimate influence over your life and mine. And so therefore, I'd like to share with you a few specific implications. The first implication is this, is that if Jesus is Lord, by the way, I said that if Jesus is Lord, if you accept Jesus as Lord, then something's going to change, something's going to be different, and here's the first one, I am his what? See that there? Servant. I am his servant. We live in a day and an age where, frankly, there's a lot of people who come in and out of churches, and uh, I hear different people say this, I'm trying to find the right church that has this program and this program, and they shop around churches as if it's kind of like going to a smorgasbord. Mm -hmm. When it comes to what we do in life, they change jobs because rather than just trying to get a paycheck, if you will, they want all these benefits or different things. There's all kinds of we, we want. I'm not saying wants are bad. But when it comes to the things that we desire, let's remind ourselves that if Jesus is Lord, if you claim Jesus Christ as Lord, then you are his, what? Servant. We ought to serve our Savior. We look at the Word of God, and again, we look at the terminology that Simon used. Simon said in verse 16, Simon Peter, Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. If Jesus is Lord, that means he is the king. That means we are his subjects. And by the way, we are more than just merely subjects. We are his children. We are joint heirs with him. But we need to make him the ruler of our lives. And we need to be his servant. A second implication is this. If Jesus Christ is Lord, then he must be preeminent in my life. That means we don't subvert him, we don't make him little, but he needs to grow in value. He needs to grow in influence. He needs to grow in our thoughts. He needs to be shown more in our actions. Colossians 1.8 says, And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That means the first. You say, Jesus is supposed to have the first place in my life? Absolutely. Every first place. Not just some, but every first place. Your waking moments should be tied to Jesus Christ. Before you eat, you know why we pray? Because we recognize Christ's preeminence before we eat. When it comes to going to church, we lift up the name of Jesus Christ on the first day of the week. When we give our tithes and our offerings, we give of the first part, not the last part. Why? Because we give Jesus Christ the first part because he is preeminent in all things. We need to take note that he is the head. Take note that he is to be preeminent, as the scripture says, in all things, not just in some things. And everything in my life, whether it is big or whether it is small, in all, all, wow, all, it all belongs to him. A third implication is this. If Jesus Christ is Lord, well, this is a hard one, then I must adapt to him. And not he to me. I need to adapt to him. And not he to me. Take your Bibles. I'm going to look over at Philippians chapter number 4. Or Philippians 2 rather for a moment. Be there in the book of Matthew. You can flip over a few books in the middle of the New Testament. The book of Philippians. Philippians chapter number 2. 
2, and I'm going to begin reading there in verse number 5. I'm going to kind of read down through verse number 11 after a moment. We think about Philippians chapter number 2, and it reminds us about the mind of Jesus Christ, about what it is that Jesus Christ has done for us, leaving us an example of how we ought to live. Philippians chapter number 2, I begin reading there in verse number 5, along with me there. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. So many times we want to be recognized. Well, Jesus said this. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Then it says this. And being found in fashion as a man, he, you see the next word there? What does it say? Humbled himself. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of what? The cross. By the way, let me just kind of size it up here for a second. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted in Jesus as your Savior yet, remind yourself of this. Jesus died on the cross for you. Three days later, he rose again from the dead to purchase your salvation, to remind you that, yes, as he said, he is the Lord. Jesus said he was going to rise again, but if he was still in the grave, he wouldn't be so much of a God, would he? But Jesus Christ rose again to promise and to assure us of this great truth that, yes, he is the Lord. Jesus Christ reminds us of this, that we must adapt to him and not he to us. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you like everything that God does in your life? Probably not. Some of you have lost people in your life. They've passed away. Some of you have lost jobs. Some of you have gained things in life, such as uh, disease. Or as uh, uh, Saul said, he had a, uh, Paul said he had a thorn in the flesh, whatever that thorn in the flesh might be. There are things in our lives that we like there, and we want to keep those. There are things in our lives that we don't like. But how many of you know this, that God ordains and he gives us things? Here's the truth. We need to learn to adapt to God and not he to us. That's a hard truth to learn. But when we remember that Jesus Christ is the king, it becomes a bit easier. The Bible says in Philippians 2.12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not, uh, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because we need to trust Almighty God. A final implication I'd like to remind you about, in just actually I'll get to that in just a second. I want to remind you about our God just for a second. J.B. Phillips, in his classic book, he, he wrote a, a book called Your God is Too Small. He suggests a wide range of images that people, including lots of Christians, have in their minds regarding God. They kind of create God, and they kind of show Jesus in different ways. And he gives interesting titles to the images. See if anything any of these images kind of strike you as familiar with what you imagine God to be or other people that you know. What about this? God, the resident policeman. Like you always feel like you're being hunted down, like you're going to be in trouble. The parental hanger, who's always looking over your shoulder. The grand old man. The meek and mild Jesus. The God of absolute perfection. The God who is a heavenly bosom. God in a box, and he kind of, we pull him out when we need him. God, who is the managing director. God, the second-hand inheritance. Uh, we think about God. Some people say he's the perennial grievance in life. What about the pale Galilean, as if Jesus, when he came to this world, he was weak and mild, and he was weak and sickly, if you will. We think about God, the projected image, and so many times we put them on a wall. We see images or uh, different things that seem to be a picture of God, but we fail to miss the point. The essential point is this. To adapt to Jesus, I must have his mind and attitude rather than the one that I want to have. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 reminds us about the importance of walking with God, as we've just seen in that text. So this morning, let me remind you of a fourth thought, a fourth implication. And if Jesus is Lord, then he will ultimately be acknowledged as Lord. You ever think about that? Whether the world thinks Jesus is Lord now or not, if he is Lord, at some point, everybody will understand that he is Lord. Did you get that? It, it seems like sometimes we go through the daily processes of life and we forget that, you know, I don't know, the, the world doesn't recognize Jesus as Lord. Maybe I can get away with something. 
Sometimes we skirt around a little. I really don't need to go to church today. You know, it's okay. The fact is this. If Jesus is Lord, someday he is going to be recognized by not just you and me, people who claim to be followers of him, but he is Lord and will be recognized as Lord by everybody, even those today who do not recognize him as Lord. Hey, where is that in the Bible? We continue reading. If you've got your Bible, it's in the Philippians chapter number 2 again. I'm going to read down to verses 9 through 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. You ever hear that expression? You, you know, you're making your way through your life and mom and dad say, go make a name for yourself. Hold on a second. Don't make a name for yourself. Make a name for Jesus. Make sure that you're serving Jesus. Why? Because his name is so much more valuable. His name is lifted up above every name. That, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To what? To the glory of God the Father. Today we understand and we recognize that Jesus Christ will ultimately be acknowledged as Lord. And even though the devil doesn't like it, someday he's going to bow. And even though you have some agnostic or some atheist friends, let me remind you, someday they will also bow. When it comes to the demons that are in this world, when it comes to the powers that are in this world, that do not want to recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord, someday we will all bow. And we will all bend before God. And we will lift him up and recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So the question is this, will you recognize Jesus as the supreme Lord of all? Will you recognize Jesus as the supreme Lord of all? Notice what I did not just ask is, when is the United States government going to recognize that? What I did not ask is, when is my neighbor going to recognize that? What I did not ask is, when is my boss going to recognize that? No, what I asked you is, based upon the word of God, is this question. Will you recognize this truth that Jesus Christ is the, not just Lord of all, he is the supreme Lord of all. By the way, this is a heavy subject because it's full of implications. And by the way, this subject is none more important than any other. I mean, it is the most important subject you can ever think about. The implications pose some big questions for us as God's stewards, as managers of our lives, of our relationships, of our marriages, of our home, of the, the work that we do, the school that we do. Everything that we do, the thoughts that we think, the words that we say, there are great implications. Because if Jesus is Lord, all that we are, sin, that's not a whole lot. But all that we are, guess what? It's his. And by the way, let me remind you, everything you have, it belongs to his too. So we remember today that God is in control. Vision is vital. And if you would recognize that Jesus Christ is the supreme Lord, remember that nothing matters more than a clear vision of the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Because he is Lord of all. And all, not just some, but all, are answerable to Jesus Christ. Daniel Webster, the one that I'm speaking about, is the great American statesman of the 19th century. He was once asked this question. He was asked, what is the most profound thought you have ever had? So I'll ask you, what is the most profound thought that you have ever had? Instantly, he responded. He said, the most profound thought ever to enter my mind is the idea that I am personally accountable to the God who made me and who spoke the worlds into existence. You and I are accountable to the supreme Lord of this universe. And this morning, we do not make Lord, uh, Jesus Lord. He is Lord already. 
He is not Lord just because you exist. He is already Lord and he will always be Lord. And we are wise to steward our days. We are wise to steward our resources and our relationships and our opportunities for none but our Lord and Savior today. Why? Because he is the supreme Lord. Would you bow with me for prayer this morning? With your heads bowed and with your eyes closed, I'd like to know how to pray for you today. First question is this. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? When we think about Jesus being the supreme Lord of our lives, first of all, it starts with him being the Savior of your life. Because we recognize this, that if you're going to spend eternity with him, then you need to know him. The very first point that we talked about today reminds us that in order to know Jesus Christ, it's only found through him. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. Here's my first question. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? If you are saved, you know that you have a relationship with Christ today. Would you do this as a word of testimony? Would you simply put your hand up and say, yes, I know Christ is my Savior. I'm bound for an eternity in heaven. I have a relationship with him. I appreciate that. Hands across the auditorium. Many, many, many hands. I appreciate those hands. You put those hands down. There are some of you who did not lift your hands. I'm thankful for your honesty. And what I'd like to do is I'd love to introduce you to Jesus Christ today. If you're here this morning, maybe you didn't raise your hand just a moment ago, you say, yes, I do not know Jesus as my Savior, but I would like to know him. If that's your prayer this morning, I'm looking across the auditorium, all eyes are closed, and all of our heads are bowed. If you would like to trust Christ as your Savior this morning, would you simply do this? Put your hand up in the air, and wait till I see it, then put it down. I'm looking across the auditorium, looking for your hand, and say, yes, I am not saved, but I would like to know Jesus as my Savior. I'd like to make him the Savior of my life. This morning, I want to encourage you to trust and to know Him this morning. In just a few moments, we'll have an invitation time, and when we all stay and I'll begin with a word of prayer, I invite you to step out, and we'll show you from the Bible how you can know Jesus as your Savior. Christians, many of you raised your hands a few moments ago. Is Jesus really the supreme Lord of your life? Good question. Is He really in first place, the one who is preeminent? This morning, how many of you say, I need to make Jesus preeminent somewhere? I need to make Jesus preeminent in every area of my life. And by the way, that means everything. You say, Pastor, you can list all kinds of stuff. You're absolutely right. I can list all kinds of stuff. And you're probably listing some things in your mind right now, and you might need to be wrestling with God about a few of them. Some of them are pretty easy. Coming to church today, you're here. That's easy. What about next Sunday? What about giving to God? What about sharing the gospel? What about reading the Bible tomorrow morning? Uh, about spending time with God in prayer? What about being a good testimony at work? What about making sure that your speech is honoring to God? What about making sure that you live a right testimony before other people? And by the way, there's a lot of other stuff. What about you know when somebody does something mean towards you and how you choose to respond? We need to choose to let Christ be the preeminent, supreme Lord and ruler of our lives. And how many of you, knowing you're a Christian, you're on your way to heaven, you have a relationship with Christ, you lift your hand this morning saying, yep, I have some places and some areas of my life, and today I raise my hand saying this, Lord, I want you to be supreme. I want you to be the supreme Lord and ruler of my life. Would you lift those hands this morning? Several hands today. I appreciate those hands. If your hands are up, let me encourage you to do this. Would you stay where you are? Let me encourage you, as I begin to pray, that this invitation time will be an extension of those raised hands. That you would come before the Lord. And just like the Word of God says, and, uh, <clears throat> as we just read a few moments ago, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Are you, is your life bringing glory to God the Father? As I pray, let's surrender our lives to God. I need you. I want you to be the supreme Lord and ruler of my life. As we pray, let's make those motions forward and let God do a great work in our lives together. Lord, I thank you for the hands, many hands that are raised. I ask that you would help us to be surrendered to you. And that this would be a year where we say, God, you are preeminent. You are first. Lord, you know this. We wrestle every day with who's going to be king. Who are we going to follow? But right now, with our whole hearts, bowing toward you, we say, God, we want you to be first. We want you to be preeminent. We want you to be the supreme Lord and ruler, King and Christ of us. Lord, help us to make Jesus Christ the King of our church, the 
king of our homes, the king of all that we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. And God's speaking to you as we sing this song this morning. Let's lift up Jesus and let's let Christ be the first place of our lives today.
school and some things like that. And so we would talk to people and say, hey, we have Southland Christian Academy. And uh, when I came to the school, I was like, where is that? And I said, well, it's at Open Door Baptist Church. Said, oh, we know where that is. That's the, oftentimes they call it the big church on the interstate and uh, that way. But they recognize where we are. And then you're trying to work through signage and some different things, too. And we figured out this, that sometimes it's kind of hard to say Open Door Baptist Church, Southland Christian Academy, and the Open Door uh, Child Development Center. That's a lot of words to put on one sign. And so we were trying to uh, think through some different things. A few years ago, we kind of thought about this and uh, kind of prayed about what we might be able to do. And so we're trying to simplify a little bit so that everybody knows where we are. And so what we've done, and I've uh, talked to the deacons about this recently as well, uh, this last year. And so we have, we're in the process of, you'll start to see some more things as we come into this next year. Uh, we're changing the name of our school. Uh, Southland is great, but you'll see that we are now, or will be, not currently, we will be, uh, so, uh, Open Door Baptist Church School or Academy and Dickens. Okay, so we have here, so you can see Open Door Christian Academy. And you can see our logo and stuff on there. So you'll start to see that as time goes on. So as you start to see some of the progress and some of the changes and some things there, you'll start to see why. And so when somebody says, uh, when we tell somebody where we go to school at Open Door Christian Academy, it kind of makes sense that it's a part of Open Door Baptist Church, okay? And so hopefully we'll start to deal with and connect with some people that way and looking forward to that as well. And you'll start to see that too. We also have some brochures that we'll be making available. So if you'd like to pick up some of those, we'll have those available uh, in the foyer, I think, afterward. And I'm excited about that as well. So looking forward to those things. And excited about pre-enrollment and re-registration for this next year, too. And so please be praying for our school as we start to get some of this stuff uh, in roll or enacted for this next year. And excited about that, too. I don't know if I can. Okay. My wife's symboling to me, but I'm not sure exactly. Say again. Bible school. Bible school. Bible school. <laughs> Oh, five new students, yes. We do have five new students. This is an exciting thing, too. We have five new students. Uh, as well. and, uh, sorry, I didn't learn sign language. And uh, so, Brother Mark, we have some special tutoring classes. You speak sign language so I can know how to communicate with my wife from afar. Uh, as far as we're very excited about what God's doing in our school. And some of you, many of you are families who come through our school and connected with our ministry that way. We're very, very excited about what God's continuing to do. Looking forward to how will God will bless our school uh, in the future as well. Blackburn's doing a great job, and I'm thankful that uh, for Brother Blackburn and his leadership in our school ministry. Looking forward to what God will do uh, in the future. Amen. That's awesome. I'm much better at reading lips than Pastor is. Yeah. Um, just kidding. Normally it takes quite a bit of sign language for me to understand something. But uh, let me remind you of just a few things coming up. Don't forget, Pastor mentioned earlier in the service that tonight we have a deacon commissioning service. Looking forward to that. Choir, we do start back at practice at 5 o'clock, so be here at 5. And listen, if you're interested in being a part of our music team, our choir is a great place to start. We meet at 5 o'clock, so come on tonight. We meet back here in this room. This is our choir room, our band room. And so you can just head back there tonight at 5 o'clock and love to have you just uh, sit in um, for a rehearsal, especially some of you that join us for Christmas part. It'd be great to see it carry on throughout the year. Um, and then uh, don't forget, again, so we'll have our service at 6 o'clock. Now, uh, coming up in just a few weeks, we have our stewardship banquet, so make sure you mark for that. Uh, one thing that we're planning on doing is we are not you just come and be a part of it. We're looking at getting it catered and some things like that. So we'll have a great time. We focused, and Pastor reminded earlier, the month of January, we focus on stewardship. Um, and a lot of times when you think about stewardship, you just think financially, right? Think about, oh, what am I giving? And, but that's not what we just focus on here at Open Door Baptist Church. We look at everything, every aspect. Pastor spoke this morning about Christ being Lord. And you know, understand this, if he's Lord of everything, he's not just a Lord of your wallet or your purse or whatever. He's Lord of your time. He's Lord of the talents, the abilities God has given you to give back to him. And so he mentioned earlier, next week we have team ministry meeting. And we invite everyone that's a part of our church to be here for that meeting because we want you to get involved. Whether it's teaching a class, maybe helping with the kids on Wednesday night, or maybe it's being a youth volunteer, singing in the choir, or playing an instrument. Whatever it is, we want you to serve some way. And there's a lot of ways to do that. You may say, I can't get in front of people. I can't do those kind of things. Well, we have a clean and fix team. And you might have an ability just to take something and be able to repair it or, or what have you. And so we have a place for you to serve. And we want everyone plugged in. So be here next Sunday night for that. And then the next Sunday we'll have our stewardship 
um, banquet where we focus on committing to that. And so you'll see a lot as we lead up to that, and we want you to be a part of it. So there's information on that. And then a couple weeks after, we have our Valentine's Day, but we do this annually for couples. And so we want you to go ahead and mark your calendar for that. It is Sunday, February 9th at 6 p.m. And so uh, we'll give you more information. Those tickets will go on sale soon. We're, we're working out some of the final details this week, and hopefully we'll have that available for you uh, next week on our couples Valentine's Day. But, but go ahead and mark your calendar so you have that free for that. Uh, let's see. There's other things in the bulletin like uh, reminders of our campus project. 31 days of prayer. Have you been doing that with our church? I know we have that available on our website, um, but we're taking each day and focusing on something that we can pray with together as a church body. So if you're not a part of it, head to our website, uh, click on that link, and you'll see you can just print that out. If you need a, a printable copy, you can ask one of us following the service, and we'll find you one and make sure you can take that home and pray with our church about different things through the month of January. So those are the things, some of the things going on. Hopefully you'll be back tonight for a great service. But we'll just stand let's close with a word of prayer. Again, if this is your first time, um, we have a guest packet for you. If you did not get one when you came in the door this morning, uh, stop by our welcome center. Pick one up on your way out. Pastor will be back there as well as Miss Amy Sue, the one that was signing all those words to him earlier. And love to, uh, they'd love to have the opportunity to greet and meet you and talk with you this morning. Let's pray as we close our service. Dear God, we thank you today for how you've worked, Lord. The time we had to worship you and lift you up and song, Lord, and then the focus in your word is we realize you truly are Lord. Lord, we can try to deny it, we can try to avoid it, Lord, but one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord of all. And Lord, I pray that as we live out our life now, we will realize this and we will grasp that concept and we will live a life that is pleasing to you, Lord. I pray today if someone, as they've heard the gospel and heard the, the, the word of God preached and taught, Lord, and they have questions about knowing you as Savior, Lord, I pray they'll find someone, find me, find pastor, find one of our ushers or deacons, Lord, and, and uh, give us an opportunity to share the gospel, to show them from your word how they can know you and have a relationship with you this morning. Lord, bless us as we go. Bring us back safely this season for your service. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.